welcome to The Agenda. I'm Stephen Cole and this week we're rethinking retail as we consider how the world's high streets can recover from the COVID-19 shutdown. Stores are now reopening, but just how many outlets can survive this multi-billion dollar downturn? Plus, has the shopping experience changed forever? We'll be speaking to the experts to find out. And is this the end of the bricks and mortar shop? Have the online giants won the final battle for our cash? Closed. The pandemic is a calamity for many European and American retailers. The crushing effects of the COVID-19 pandemic are already becoming dramatically apparent. Sales dried up, not so much overnight as within hours. For those without much of an online presence, they vanished altogether. And for those that were already struggling, including some well-known brands, the future looks bleak. The world of fashion and shopping can be dismissed as frivolous, but in fact it has to be taken seriously as one of the world's most significant fiscal heavyweights. The International Monetary Fund says the size of the downturn and the pace of recovery will be harder on the retail market than that of the 2009 recession. In 2020, worldwide retail sales are expected to reach 23.6 trillion US dollars, and that's down nearly 6% from last year. At the height of the lockdown, the UK saw the sharpest ever fall in high street footfall, and 24,000 retail jobs were lost. Big high street names like Laura Ashley, Kath Kidson, and TM Lewin haven't survived. And many of those that have, like Sweden's H&M, have closed dozens of branches across Europe. Spanish fashion and homeware giant Zara might have to close up to 1,200 stores worldwide. The effect will be most dramatic for department stores reliant on clothing sales because they'll find themselves saddled with a season of more of soon to be outdated clothes. The pandemic is accelerating longer term trends. People are spending less on clothes than they used to and more on eating out and holidays. Store closures are also hastening the demise of struggling shopping centers. E-commerce will be the biggest winner. Amazon saw such a rapid rise in demand that its infrastructure has shown signs at times of buckling. Where online shopping used to be a thing of convenience, it's now become a necessity. And companies who are hesitant to digitize have had to redraw their corporate projections overnight. For once, luxury brands aren't immune. Sales have fallen by $11 billion this year. Major fashion shows in London, the catwalks of Paris and Milan have gone silent. The retail industry has changed dramatically for consumers, companies and just about everyone employed by the industry. The real question is just how permanent will these changes be? With me to consider where the retail industry now finds itself and exactly what the future might hold is retail analyst and author Mark Pilkington. Um, Mark, uh, very cleverly, your book, Retail Therapy, Why the Retail Industry is Broken and What Can Be Done to Fix It, was actually written over a year ago, uh, wasn't it? Uh, before the pandemic. So if retail was suffering then, how much is it suffering now? Well, um, unfortunately, it's suffering very badly. Uh, it's, uh, as you say, uh, the retailers went into the pandemic crisis in quite bad shape. They suffered years of loss of sales to the internet. Uh, they'd seen their control of branding sort of broken by all the peer-to-peer -peer reviews and the social media. And they were also facing rising costs, courtesy of sort of business rates, um, rising product prices with after Brexit, with the pounds collapse. They went in rather short of cash. We'd already seen a lot of bankruptcies. Uh, we'd seen House of Fraser, we'd seen Debenhams, Mother Care, some big names and they went into this crisis very, very short of uh, ammunition. So what the pandemic effectively has done is speed up a current trend? Absolutely. I mean, we see a number of trends uh, that have been accelerated. For example, the growth of online. During the lockdown itself, many people turned to online, and the share of the UK uh, retail, total retail that is online, went from 20% in January up to 30% in May which is an increase of about 10%, which took about 10 years previously to achieve. You mainly focus 
uh, in your book on the UK and US. What is the European situation? What's happening in France and Germany, for example? Well, of course, the effect of COVID has been the same any, everywhere that's had it. Uh, the lockdowns and uh, uh, the, the damage to the cash flow of retailers. In a more long-term sense, um, it depends on how advanced the internet penetration was. I mean, in Northern Europe, for example, it was quite high and we saw quite a lot of damage to places like Holland and, and, and Germany. Southern Europe only had internet penetration levels of around 5%, so we had much less of an effect. And it, it varied around the world. China had very high internet penetration um, and its, its retail sector barely got started before it was coming under pressure. But then areas like India and the Middle East South America, the internet wasn't as developed, so, so retail did get uh, a bit more time uh, to sort itself out. I mean, shouldn't the retailers have been better prepared for this? Shouldn't they have thought ahead a lot more? Well, I think that the, you know, the retail industry has been guilty of quite a lot of complacency over actually the last 20 years because, uh, for example, I started a dot-com in the year uh, 1999, and we thought at that time we were going to destroy retail. Um, and, of course, didn't happen at that time. But it's not like the retailers haven't had lots of warning of the rise of the Internet. It's been going on for, for 20 years. And I think for a long time, they considered it to be the poor relation within their business. And they didn't really develop strong digital arms. Those that did, I mean, there are some exceptions. Someone like Next, for example, got their Internet sales up to 50% of their total by the time the crisis hit. So they were able to actually trade through the COVID crisis. But many retailers that have internet uh, channels that only represent uh, less than five or ten percent of their business and those guys of course um in the non-food sector were absolutely pummeled by the by, by the lockdown for example primark uh literally did no sales at all during the lockdown they lost a complete three months of sales you're painting a pretty gloomy picture uh, of the high street aren't, aren't reports of its death greatly exaggerated uh, on the basis that we are, we are, we, we do like to shop. We like to go out. We like to meet other people and shop and try things on. Yes, we do like to shop, and this is where I talk about, you know, the medium term and the long term. I think in the medium term, which is what we're in now, which is the post opening up, uh, I think a lot of the enjoyment has been stripped out of shopping because, when you think about it, things like. The advantages that retail still enjoyed over the internet, for example, being able to try things on, being able to say, uh, try colours in cosmetics, uh, to go out shopping with friends, to have a cup of coffee while you're doing it, uh, to browse up and down in a relaxed kind of way. Um, a lot of that's been shut down because, you know, you've got to wear masks, you've got to socially distance, you can't try things on. Um, it's really, at the moment, it's not a terribly pleasurable experience and it, and it won't be until the fear of the COVID has been removed. Some experts, uh, I don't know if you're uh, suggesting this, that the pandemic may actually allow high streets across Europe to diversify. This could be the rebirth of the high street, but in a very different way. Yes, I think because it's stripped away the final strands of complacency, I think it is a real opportunity to, for retail to evolve. But what it's got to do is it can't be uh, treat itself as a kind of poor relation of the internet. I think that the, you know, basically the internet has proven itself extremely efficient at stocking and shipping goods to people and providing a, a very easy way of buying goods. And retail has to move away from its focus on supplying goods, which was always its traditional function, and become much more of an experiential uh, environment. Um, I don't think we need to have the amount of stock in stores that we have, and a lot more space could be devoted to uh, fantastic um, virtual reality and real uh, displays, what we call exploratoriums, brand exploratoriums, which is where you have a special three-dimensional experience of the brand and its values, and perhaps an educational experience about how it's made and put together that basically draws you into the brand. And then the actual goods themselves, and they can be ordered in lots of different ways. They can be ordered on screens in the store or afterwards at home or over the internet. But the store itself becomes really the exciting environment where you, you experience the brand. So there you are. There's the trend. Um, a high street full of um, not shops but brand exploratoriums. Uh, you heard it here That's first. It. <laughs> Mark Biltington, many <laughs> thanks for joining us on the agenda. No problem. It was great. Thanks.
Retailers around the world are always trying to forecast the next big thing in an attempt to future-proof their businesses. So how has the pandemic changed that? Or has it proved no business can ever be completely ready for that unexpected global event? Well, joining me now is Joe McDonald. Joe is head of insight for the trend forecasting company WGSN. How, Joe, has the pandemic changed our relationship with shopping? So the main change has been the pivot towards e-commerce. So we've seen consumers that wouldn't usually um, be in, interested in, in shopping online, shop out of online mainly just due to necessity. But we've also seen different categories that um, don't lend themselves particularly well to online shopping adopt new, interesting, uh, innovative formats. So one of the main ones is uh, AR or augmented reality. So this idea that you can use your camera to try on a lipstick to see how it will look on your face, and then you can order that lipstick. But for uh, consumers, and particularly in the, um, the groceries market, this brand loyalty has diminished. So they're concerned about how quickly they can get something and when it can be delivered. So when they're not shopping online, one of the few reasons that people have been allowed to leave the house uh, during lockdown around the world is to go shopping. It's become a highlight of people's days. And um, as a result, people have become a lot more considered about what they're buying. People uh, are enjoying going to the shops more, particularly to do grocery shopping. But what about the brand-consumer relationship? Has that changed at all? Yeah, so this is really interesting. So consumers have really expected brands to step up in the space. And it started in the East, um, particularly in China, where uh, manufacturers began to pivot their manufacturing to um, create masks and, and to create PPE. And then it, it began to creep over into the West. So we saw uh, Inditex, the company that owns Zara, repurposing its factory uh, and production and logistics networks to um, produce protective gear. Mango did a similar thing, um, distributing face masks. Um, LVMH shifted all their production of um, perfumes to creating hand sanitizer. Uh, Diageo launched this $100 million uh, recovery fund for bars and bartenders. And consumers responded really well to this. They, they want to see that everyone is pitching in to um, help society and to help one another uh, during the pandemic. And for brands in particular, if it ties into their purpose, if they can truly add value and pivot their operations to help, consumers respond well to that. And what about the international uh, impact on markets? Uh, how do footfall numbers compare in, in the major European cities? This one's a little bit more difficult to call, but when people are returning to shops and, and to shopping centres, they're not lingering because there's still this anxiety in, in actually being enclosed in a physical retail space. And brands and, and companies are responding well to this because they're actually stripping back their stock and, and opening up stores more and, and looking at doing outdoor pop-ups. What about spending? Are people, I mean, a lot of people have been furloughed. Uh, are they going to be spending more? Are they going to be more careful with their money? Consumer sentiment is very, very uncertain about the future. And while in China, we saw um, something that we're calling revenge spending, which is when you come out of lockdown and, and you've kind of been cooped up in your house and you want to go and spend money to make, make up for the, uh, the lost time and, and, and lost spending, um, we're yet to see that in significant numbers in the West. So while, while retail has increased in the UK, for consumers, especially as we head towards what is likely to be a very, very deep recession, really for them it's thinking about does it represent value? Does it do its job? And particularly in fashion, um, there's this requirement to think about can it do multiple jobs? So if, if you're commuting on a bike, it does the item of clothing you're buying, can it go from um, cycling into the office space? And then the main one for consumers as they think about um, purchasing and spending their money is, is this underlying sentiment of, will it keep me safe? Will it help protect me in, uh, in future outbreaks? What about your job, Joe? Has, has the virus changed trend forecasting? Absolutely. So, so the main thing is that um, the virus has accelerated it. 
So trends that we, we've been tracking and we've been pitching them at about two to five years out have kind of emerged overnight. So, so obviously I mentioned it earlier, the main one is um, e-commerce, but what we're seeing is this pivot towards localism. So people becoming more engaged in their local communities, interacting more with their local communities, supporting each other, and this, this idea of community 3.0. The other one is um, the environmental focus. So it's, it's really highlighted our impact on the environment. And it's also shown um, to consumers and to governments that, that when there is swift action, uh, when everyone's working together, how quickly an issue can be dealt with. And then the final one that, that again has, has really accelerated is this idea of remote working. So this idea of flexi working and and uh, home offices and, and not everyone needing to be in the same space to be productive. Are all these changes, Joe, just for now, or do you see them all lasting? Well, there's, there's quite a good framework to think about the changes that you're observing. And essentially, it's this idea of connection versus convenience. So anything that uh, has made our lives easier, so e-commerce is, is the prime example here with flexible returns and the, the ability to have stuff delivered next day, that's going to stick around because it's made consumers' lives so much smoother. But anything involved in the connection part, so, so to your point around human behavior and the way we interact with each other, it's unlikely that these are going to stick afterwards. So the prime example will be, as we move out of lockdown, we're unlikely to keep celebrating um, birthdays on Zoom. You know, that behavior is not going to stick. But for consumers, we're going to continue to be hygiene focused. So they're thinking about what will keep them safe, but also stability focused. What can they introduce into their lives that are going to make them easier and just help return to normality? Those are the key priorities. In what form do you see consumer confidence uh, coming back once this crisis is over? What kind of priorities have changed for the consumer? So the main one is um, hygiene. Consumers are extremely hygiene focused because they've spent you know, the better half of this year being concerned about um, how they look after themselves. And that's going to continue. So everything from the use of public space through to getting on airplanes and even trying on clothes in shops and, and going back to restaurants, consumers are going to be so focused on hygiene that it's actually be gonna become a selling point for a lot of brands. Kind of spinning off that, the other main one would be um, wellness. So again, um, anything with um, qualities that will boost uh, consumers' immune systems or anything with health benefits, people are gravitating towards and, and responding well to. And then the last one would probably be around stability. It's been an incredibly um, difficult and, and um, stressful uh, year, and consumers are looking for solutions for them and their families that, that will make their lives easier and, and return them as quickly as possible to normality. Joe McDonnell, many thanks, Joe, for joining us here on the agenda for your insights. Thank you very much. Still to come here on the agenda, we'll see how the lockdown has affected the luxury retail market as we look at the changing face of high fashion. The pandemic is changing the world as we know it, but within the challenges lie tremendous opportunities as people and industries make the most of a new era. Watch our special week-long series, Redesigning the Future, starting Monday the 31st of August on CGTN's Global Business. Search CGTN Europe wherever you get your podcasts to subscribe to The Agenda podcast. The Agenda with me, Stephen Cole, always gets to the heart of the story. Just subscribe today and listen now. Welcome back to The Agenda. As we've heard, clearly there will be major changes to the way we shop and our fashion choices at the lower price points. But what about the luxury market? How has that been affected? And where has lockdown left the world of fashion? Joining me now from Saint-Tropez in southern France is style journalist and author of many books, including Deluxe, How Luxury Lost Its Luster, and Fashionopolis, The Price of Fast Fashion and the Future of Clothes, Dana Thomas. Um, Dana, what have you noticed about the changing shape of fashion during lockdown? Well, there's been a lot of changes. Already there's been change in consumer 
patterns and habits because stores were closed. So we haven't been shopping as much. And when we did shop, we were buying things that were more comfortable, that we wanted to be feel in, enrobed and swathed in softness and comfort as opposed to strict tailoring and, and, um, and dressing up for the office because we were home and because we're doing things like Zoom. And then at the same time, we've also seen a big change in the way business is being done. The stores were closed, people were laid off or furloughed. There was a lot of leftover inventory because of this, these closures. And now luxury companies are overwhelmed with all the clothes that they thought they were gonna sell in the spring and in the summer. Do you see, Dana, that uh, sustaining that trend for the luxury market? Because in the past, as you well know, the luxury market is rarely affected by downturns. Well, it is. It used to rarely be affected by downturn because basically luxury catered to a class of shoppers who were immune to economic downturns. But during the 1990s and 2000s with globalization, Luxury went democratic, meaning that they started making, targeting the middle market consumer with things like accessories, logo covered items, sunglasses, scarves, perfumes, lipsticks, lower priced items. And that's the market, that's the market segment that when the economic crisis comes, closes its wallet to things that aren't necessary like luxury items. It's not their way of life, it's something special the uber rich who aren't touched by this. So they lost a few billion. They still have many billion. They're still shopping at Louis Vuitton. They're still flying on their private jets. But you and I are having a hard time making our mortgage payments. So we're not going to go out and buy an Hermes scarf. Yes, I, I, I must admit not to being a member of the uber rich uh, straight away. <laughs> so well, journalists never really are. And if they are, you want to know why. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, if, if the uber rich haven't been unduly affected in terms of their shopping habits, what about those of us who aren't uber rich? What about the high street? H how has that been affected? Well, that's been affected enormously, too, because those stores and those businesses are based on volume. Their profits, their, their, their whole raison d'etre, their business model is based on volume. And if your stores are closed for four months, you are not moving any volume. So they too are overwhelmed with inventory. Many even canceled their orders for things they'd already had made and clothes were sitting on the docks in Bangladesh unable to be shipped. And so then the, comp the workers in Bangladesh weren't getting paid because the contractors weren't getting paid because the brands weren't paying anybody because they canceled the orders. So it's made for a big economic mess, but it's also making for a terrible environmental mess because you sort of scratch your head and say, what are we going to do with all these clothes that we aren't buying and wearing? And are they going to land up in landfill? Are they going to, you know, go in the trash? Are they going to just, are we going to see them being burned and shredded? It's just awful on sort of every front because the business model of volume is so wasteful. We're not seeing catwalks uh, at the moment for obvious reasons. And you started by saying people are more relaxed in what they're wearing because they're at home. Will that extend back into sort of, sort of normal life, if I can call it that? Will there be a more um, relaxed, casual approach to fashion? I do think so. I think that we're all going to keep working at home for a while. I have colleagues who've been told they're not supposed to be in the office until January. And if there's a, you know, a second surge of this horrid virus, that may not happen in the winter either. And I think what's happening is that, you know, we used to have casual Fridays, and I think it's now going to be casual every day. And we'll be working wearing, you know, something kind of easy going, like just a crisp white shirt and, and, uh, and not have to get all formal and dressed up. At the same time, I think when we do finally go out, it'll be such a celebration. It'll feel like every night will feel like New Year's Eve that we will get dolled up. But we'll probably shop our closets and say, you know, I've missed wearing these things. So we want to buy what we or wear what we already have and not buy so much new. I have to say, watching the fashion shows, the digital fashion shows on the platforms this last week and two, or two, they sort of fell out of touch with how we're all feeling right now, that they're about buying really beautiful, fabulous clothes for a fabulous life. And we're not really living it right now. Oh, yeah. And it kind of, it's the first time I've ever watched fashion shows and really thought, this kind of feels a little frivolous. It's really out of tune with the mood of right now. Yeah, that's the, exactly right. I mean, I'm sitting here dressed in a suit with a tie. Uh, will, we, will we say goodbye to the tie in future, do you think? 
I think ties are on their way out. They were already on their way out. They were for, you know, sort of wedding funerals and television appearances. <laughs> <laughs> but I think they're on their way out now. I mean, what, they've what, been around. Are long you saying I, I should be wearing a, a tracksuit to be on trend? Well, maybe not a tracksuit, but you know, the collar, the collar, you know, the whole high collared 19th century thing might be finally finished, like hats and gloves for women. And Dana, so back to the high street. I mean, there, there are a lot of similar brands on our high streets. Can you see some of those leaving the high street? or some kind of consolidation? Absolutely. In fact, many brands, fast fashion brands, have announced that they're closing thousands of stores and they're moving more onto digital, foreseeing the, the second wave of COVID and people at home going, what do I do? Let's shop online. Some brands never even had that much invested or, or any online presence at all. Primark only has stores and no online presence. And H&M was closing stores. Zara is closing stores. They're consolidating. But you know, folks worry that that's going to kill the high street. I think it's going to have to be exactly the opposite. I think it's going to free up the high street to bring back the local businesses that were driven out by these mega chain, mega global chains, you know, who are willing to pay higher rents. And, you know, this is an adjustment. It's a bit of an adjustment, like when the stock market crashes and economists call that an adjustment. Well, this is a bit of an adjustment too. The fashion industry is in the throes of a major collapse and it needed adjusting. It was growing too big and too fast and too huge. And there was way too much money at play and there were way too many clothes and way too many stores. And they really did kill small independent business along the way. I think that now people are out of work. They're sort of saying, I've always wanted to do this thing, have a stationary shop, have my own dressmaking shop, something like that. And the rents will be lower because of this correction. And we'll see a wonderful rebirth of the high street as it used to be. Well, that's, that's a very optimistic note and a, a great uh, way to finish. Uh, Dana Thomas, a fashion guru and shopping journalist. <laughs> Many thanks for joining <laughs> us on the agenda. Thank you for having me anytime. First, the bad news. More bricks and mortar retailers have already gone into administration this year than in the whole of last, which had already been described by some observers as the worst year for 25 years for the retail industry. Remember, consumer spending is crucial to Europe's economic revival, accounting for more than half of its economic activity. But the good news is there is some evidence that consumers across Europe are going on a shopping spree as their economies reopen, offering hope that a fragile recovery from the pandemic-induced recession may be taking hold. Retail sales in the Eurozone, which had plunged to record lows during lockdown, surged at one point by almost 18% as people rushed out to buy furniture, electronics, clothing and computer equipment. The biggest gains were in France and Germany, where spending has rebounded to near pre-confinement levels. Dutch flower and plant suppliers reported record demand as shoppers crowded do-it-yourself stores around Europe to beautify their homes. The current binge has doused some worries that Europeans might feel too shaken to spend again. It's seen that release from lockdown has spurred consumers into opening their purses again. But whether or not people will keep opening their wallets remains to be seen. Spending is still around 7% lower than where it was before the pandemic hit. Even before COVID-19 struck, high streets and shopping malls around the world were facing huge challenges. But retailers may use this pandemic-created opportunity to do a reset of their business model. And that could give both a boost to spending and give high streets around the world a much-needed facelift. Coming up on a future agenda. Europe's economies have declined during the pandemic, but so have CO2 levels. As the world begins to rebuild the future, we'll be looking at whether the grass is greener on the other side of COVID-19. Don't forget, for more agenda content, you can visit our website or you can follow us on Twitter and Facebook. But for now, from me, Stephen Cole, and all the agenda team here in London, it's goodbye. <laughs>